with that 60,000, how much revenue can you generate in a 12 month period with just that one time investment? Because have you counted marketing in there? Have you counted how to get customer acquisition? Maybe you're not asking for enough. Because what's 12 months lease? You gotta give yourself enough of a runway. So let's say you go, you want a 12 to 24 month lease, right? Yeah. What's that? 3,000 a month, 1,000, what's that? 3,000. Three. Three. That's 36,000, so let's say two years is $72,000, right? Okay. Challenge most startups, they don't ask for enough money up front, and savvy investors know you're not asking, you're not getting enough money to get some traction. Okay. So I'm okay. still looking at that period from that one to three years of revenue. Basically. We're not even looking at revenue. We're just saying, how do you stay in business? Okay, okay. Because your equipment is, how much your equipment costs? I, I put down like 10000 I mean, I put down, uh, no, I put down, uh, I on my sheet. Uh, $20,000. Okay. More than $20,000. Let's say it's, all right, let's say it's twenty k right? Okay. Okay. So twenty k in one time, and then you got your monthly. So you got lease, you got utilities, you got internet, you got staff. Okay? So you got to build a run rate basically of what's going a burn rate what's going to cost you your revenue is your run rate your expenses are your burn rate how much are you going to burn to get to a customer and then to get to break even so you got to count the cost okay well you're not even going to get get enough money yeah so then let's say let's say it's a quarter of a million dollars what's 72 let's say it's a hundred thousand but you still haven't counted in the staff is going to take to manage it until you get customers? Or do you presume that people will come first and then you get the business and then go find the staff? Or do you have to have it fully staffed? I thought I, I would want to staff some, some staff there. Okay, so you gotta build that into the, into the, into the burn rate, okay. right? Okay. Lease, utilities, internet, basic staff that's required to get you to break even or get you to your first customer. So if I'm the investor listening through this and walking you through this, every time I ask you a question and I perceive a little unsurety, in my mind I'm decreasing your valuation. Mm. Because remember, I'm a negotiator, right? I know how much I'm willing to give you potentially, but I know how much equity I want because I can spot your naivety. And if I can't point, if I look at your executive summary and say, okay, he might be a little naive, but he's got Dre on his board, then I'm backing up because I know Dre's gonna school him, right? Okay, I guess. So. You know, Rodney Jerkins is gonna school him on how to do it, do it right. But if I don't, so I'm giving you points for the co-founders and points for your advisors. Because where the co-founders lack unfair advantage, the advisors who've done it before, get it. Or if you're also telling me that you're gonna use you don't need a full-time account if you're going to use an outsource account. Like, if you were a startup telling me you're going to hire a full-time CFO, I'm like, naive. <laughs> right? I mean, we get that. We're a startup here at OHA. We, we have, a, like, a virtual CFO. So when we talk to potential investors, if we had a full-time control on staff, that's not the best use of proceeds for the amount of, you know, revenue that we're generating right now. So I want to get to the amount you need first. So let's say you probably need... If you think you need 100, multiply that times two. What's the reason? Okay. Quarter million dollars. Quarter million. Okay. Right? So I wanted to get you to your exact needs and then to what, because you're never going to count all of the costs. Something's going to come up or whatever. You know if 100, you can get it going, but you may not be able to get customers. Or now, okay, I need $100,000. At that point, is there a metric in your industry of deals like this that have been done before. There are probably some guys or ladies who invest in production studios. Like, I'm gonna take a guess. Who, who invests in production studios? Do labels do it? And if it's not the labels, do the executives at labels own pieces of production studios? Do writers, the executives at ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and Grammys, like they work those jobs, but don't think they don't get in on deals. Right? So sometimes by just asking those people, they're putting the 20,000, 40,000, 30,000, they're pooling their money, right? Crowdfunding their money, putting the money down. 
Are they doing it as a convertible note or are they doing it as straight equity? That's the question. So let's say you raise a quarter of a million dollars, not a lot of revenue or no revenue. Um, I think you want to go conservative and say, okay, we're raising a quarter of a million dollars for, I would say, like a three time multiple for a third of the company. Now, if you want to close the deal, you could do something like this. We're raising a quarter of a million dollars for initially 60% of the company. When we pay you your principal back, we'll revert back to a third. You just offer me like, okay, I'm gonna have majority control until you pay me back. Basically. Right. And then when you pay me back, that's called an event. I revert back to a lesser equity share. That's a creative way of doing it, but it gets done sometimes. The other thing is, don't ever come to the table, you know, I was just doing some um, mentoring. Um, these are actually high schoolers and some college students that are gonna be interning with us for the next four weeks. It's something we call Startup Summer, okay? Um, and we were having a conversation with Earl next door, and I was giving them an example how Peter Thiel invested a half a million dollars in Facebook when it was a pre-revenue company, right? Sean Parker, who created Napster, introduced Peter Thiel to Mark Zuckerberg. For the introduction, Sean Parker got, was it 7% or something? Which was incredibly aggressive. He got 7% just by putting it together. Mark Zuckerberg would never do that deal today, by the way. When Facebook went public, the 500,000 that he had invested in a pre-revenue, very risky startup was worth, somebody take a guess. And not, million. not by, how much? Two. No. Two billion. Is that too much? Uh, no, when it was before we came before it hit. Two billion. Four hundred fifty million. Right? It's thirty, twenty. It's fifty people in this room. You know, workforce development is paying them two k to be here for the next four weeks a program through workforce development. I told them it's 30 of y'all. Imagine if y'all had pulled y'all money together. And, Why and, school don't got this, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, had to, we had to hook it up. <laughs> we can hook it up. If not, this will get shown like the best teacher award. <laughs> okay. Hear me out. If 500,000 turned into 450 million, 50,000 would have been 45 million, right? The mindset is the crowd of people here who have an interest in starting this, don't let one man do it or two people do it. Y'all all get in and get a small piece of it. Amen. Right? Can you say that again? <laughs> Some people don't understand. Say it okay. You say it. What did I just say? <laughs> you can't let one person do it. <laughs> you can do more together than apart. Right? Well, I mean, that's, that's the key. That's the Achilles heel of our society, right? So I, I want to ask you a question. So as a pitch, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer you majority of the percentage of my company for a pitch. Not for a pitch. Well, here's the thing about pitching. You're always pitching. You're either pitching for money or you're pitching for customers or you're even pitching people to be on your team. Because if you can't convince me to be on your team, you can't even pitch an investor because invest, most investors don't invest in solopreneurs. They want to see the team. Who's on the team, who are the advisors, and can you execute? Right. So that was just one scenario that I gave you. My point is, come to the table with something. You've been able to tell me that, you know, what's your name? Maurice. Maurice, last name? Campbell. Campbell, what's the name of the company? Maurice Productions. Okay, my name is Maurice Campbell. I'm the co-founder of Maurice Productions. Um, you know, Production in America has become a commodity, particularly given um, technology and the innovation that exists today. My value proposition is that I'm going to deliver that on-demand, high-touch, high-tech, uh, aesthetic environment for up-and-coming producers to be able to create in a safe environment. 
right? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that sounds easy. Yeah, I got you. Today, I'm raising two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You know, get you know, I'm raising two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a third of my company. You don't have to you don't have to give that upfront negotiation yet. Go in with the traditional pitch. Um, today, I've invested ten thousand dollars of my own capital and from my peers, um, and even those that want to use the production studio, I've raised another fifty thousand dollars using crowdfunding. Okay. I see what you're saying. Right, and we're taking that fifty thousand dollars and we're going to apply for SBA loan because one of my, you know, unfortunately, I may not have good credit, but one of my co-founders does have good credit. So we're going to take that fifty thousand, go to the bank, and leverage that to get two fifty. However, we want to offer you an opportunity to own a third of this company at a two hundred fifty, at a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar valuation. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I like that. We want to offer you the opportunity. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so it's kind of a two-part question. One, pitching for sponsorships versus pitching for a percentage of the company. Yep. And also, once you do get sponsorships, does that help lower the percentage that you need to give away to an investor? Do they look at that as a positive in less of getting part of the company? Does your revenue model if you sponsorship? Like, is this, is this for the production studio? Or um, this is something different? Like a recording studio. Okay. Why do recording studio need sponsors? What's a or like a quick like say JBL sponsors you and gives you the monitors to use so they can okay. say JBL is a sponsor of blah 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 studio. Is there a precedent for that? Have you ever done it before? Um yeah. The Patchwork Studios, our master and engineer, is sponsored by JBL and that's the monitors that he uses. I mean Bob Whitfield, you know, yeah, was well, already a brand, right? right? You know, right. so did he get the sponsorship when he first opened Patchwork or did he get it? later when all the hits have been created. Yeah. Right. So if you're a startup, you know, studio, can you like I go back to this, we all look to the major brands. We all want to get the major brands. We all want to get to the shark tanks of the world. But there are all these minnows in the room, right? These are the sharks that you need to be appealing to today. Or hyper locally, is there Guitar Center? You know, can you get a thousand dollar sponsorship from them? And maybe you create a wall, right? that's gonna be like our founding sponsor's wall. But rather than going for big amounts of money, maybe you're asking for $1,000, $2,500, and you're gonna do a big launch event or something like that. So I think in terms of getting creative on how you raise your startup capital, any ingenuity that you apply towards getting it done is always looked favorably upon rather than just going in saying, if I don't get your money, this will not happen. You want an investor's money to be like, it's almost like kind of reversing the roles a little bit in terms of you want in on this deal because I'm going to succeed with or without you. And, but, but you're able to show the traction rather than I'm not going to succeed unless I have you. Who wants to be subjected to like, if I don't get your money, right? Just mentally, if I don't get your money, I can't succeed. build a network or a crowd, the larger your crowd, the bigger, um, you know, incentive program that you can create. I mean, we're actually doing it here at Opportunity Hub. Like we have, let's say we have over 100 startups locally we're serving, but we have a database of 10,000 startups around the country that we have access to. So we have, you know, um, lawyers, accountants, design firms, coders, they want access, you know, PEO companies, UPS, those companies, they have affinity programs. Now normally they want to do something on a revenue sharing basis, you know, but what if you had a hundred of them that said, okay, you know, we'll pay a hundred bucks a month. 
then you could take some of that money, put it into a digital ad campaign to drive leads for those companies. And when they start getting leads or interest in those affinity relationships, they'll throw more money at you. Because it all is gonna come back to what's my cost per acquisition. An affinity program is just another way a company is trying to acquire a customer. And then you, rather than having to spend ad dollars with you or sponsor dollars with you, they figure their revenue share with you will bring some credibility to what you're trying to do. So if you're able to go out there and say, I've got these brands already associated with me, it adds credibility to who you are. But yeah, absolutely. And you don't even have to be talking to like a, you know, you don't need to be talking to the CEO or the C-suite to get that done. Just find the easiest person to get a call back from in most companies is a salesperson. And most salespeople or business development people are connected to the affinity programs in their company. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a question. Okay, sure. Um, you mentioned you you are angel investor. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to them a little bit about what that is and what that entails? Sure. Um, angel investors are individuals that invest in startups and early stage companies. And they're, they kind of do it on their own terms. Um, they do it at their pace. They do it when they want to do it. It's not like a bank. It's not really transactional. It's really relational. The best way to form a relationship with an angel investor is not to send them a, a business plan or a pitch deck and ask them for money. That usually gets ignored. It's usually to send them an email. I know you're an angel investor. I'd like to learn more about who you are, your journey, your investment thesis at your pace and could you be available from time to time to maybe um, you know, answer a question or two via email? And you build that relationship and that rapport. It's gotta be really relational. Mm -hmm. So in the schematic of things, you know, when you look at raising capital for a company, it's in the idea stage, you have to be your own angel investor. So you're usually investing in your education, your, you know, the entrepreneur acumen that's required for you to understand you know, how startups are actually even built and how do you navigate. You're not going to get investors to help educate you on what you should know. You have to do that on your own. That's number one. Then you can go to your, what they call family, friends, and fools. Okay? Um, so at, in the beginning stages, it's you. you. You might be using your own credit cards or debit cards, your own cash flow to get to a certain point. Then you go out to family, friends, and they call it fools because that's people who they believe in you. Oh, here's 5,000, they ain't expecting it back. Here's 500, right? That's where crowdfunding starts to take hold. And crowdfunding are just kind of like affinity groups and crowds. Uh, we're encouraging all types of affinity groups to get together and fund, you know, just kind of, you know, other communities around the globe do this to fund early, early startups. After the family, friends, and full stage, you can go into what's called an accelerator. You can look at GAN.co, Global Accelerator Network and look at all of the different accelerators. Like they might be a music accelerator, it might be a creative arts what is it? accelerator. An accelerator is a three month cohort, very intense where you work on taking your starter from the idea stage to what's called the minimum viable product. A minimum viable product is basically, it's gonna be like your Steve Kerr, or it's gonna be your LeBron James. It's the product or service in your business that gets you to market the fastest, at the most value, at the least expense. It may not be your final ideation. A lot of MVPs are in beta. Like many of us, we were early users on Twitter and LinkedIn. It was a lot of bugs, but we wanted to use it anyway, right? So we're early adopters of a lot of new technology, but they got it, they created an MVP, got it to market. And that's, what, that's your MVP. So most accelerators want to accelerate you from idea to MVP. And then incubators take you from MVP to market. And you have like 500 startups. You have Y Combinator. You have Techstars. So you can just look at, you know, look up, you know, incubators. We have an incubator program here at um, Opportunity Hub. And before the accelerator is the pre-accelerator where you get the, 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 the entrepreneurial acumen. So a lot of accelerators, they provide you with space, contacts, and mentors, but they don't, they don't presume that you have the knowledge that's required to navigate entrepreneurship. Then after that, you look at a lot of angel investors invest in accelerators and incubators. So those that don't want to kind of fly solo will put their money in an accelerator or incubator program or in an angel network. 
and we're kind of taking these steps. After you get past angels, then you get into um, kind of like what's called the pre-seed and then the seed round. Okay, so angels are usually coming in to help you raise maybe up to uh, half a million dollars. They write in 10, 15, 20, 50, sometimes $100,000 checks depending on who they are and what their net worth is. Um, the pre-seed could be in that stage or seed round is like you're raising up to a million. By the time you get to a Series A round, that's with venture capital. So I know there's a lot of talk about venture capitalists and venture capital, but VC is like six stage. You don't go to VCs with an idea. You don't go to VCs with an MVP, unless that VC's investment thesis, and that's key. Every investor, whether it's a bank, an individual, or a VC has what's called an investment thesis. Basically, this is our philosophy of how, why, and what type of companies we like to invest in. When, the type of people, even if it's not stated in the first, you know, three to five minutes, like part of my investment thesis is, do you dream big enough? Uh, can you handle rejection? This is the, the mindset stuff. I ain't even talking about the product and services yet. Can you dream, are you dreaming big enough? Can you handle uh, being told no and rejection? Because I'll probably tell you no the first couple of times. I want to see if you keep coming back. Um, what's the third one, Earl? Uh, that's the fourth one, that's one more. Um, um, ah, that's next. So dreaming bigger, are you, can you handle rejection? Oh, will you not quit? Most entrepreneurs quit too soon. And the fourth one is coachability. If you're not coachable, I can tell really quickly. And then we're looking for that unfair advantage and we're looking for that kind of that disruptive, like are you doing something that somebody else has done before or are you doing something that's never been done before? And a lot of angels like to take their risk because they're not, we're not the most conservative people or conservative investors. So we're taking risk like, we, you know, like we're shooting for the fences. A lot of angels lose money um, and they lose a, lose a lot of it. Um, but that's, that's a little bit of kind of the path and where and where angel investing fits in, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And you mentioned you do branding, marketing and branding. Mm -hmm. So is there um, any advice you can give uh, regarding like them branding a startup and what they need to do to have a strong brand and message for what they're, you know, what they're starting? Uh, yeah, so, uh... As far as, so as far as branding in general, what are some of the things that you, you talked about? I heard the word mission statement earlier. Uh, what else do you have to do for your project? So, so question, so with this process, did you work on your branding first or did you figure out what your company was first? Well, some people knew what the branding was. So company first, company idea. Yeah, so that, that would be the biggest advice is a lot of people, especially come to me, they want to they wanna get business cards, they want to get a website, they want to be able to, you know, come up with the brand when they don't understand what... This is the can't hear in the back. Oh, okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, is that a lot of people want to try to develop a brand before they develop a company. Um, so a, a big thing about about branding is to not just look at you know what looks good to me but understanding your target audience and understanding everything from you know what's the color theory behind this so if I'm looking to go into a certain industry what are the things that appeal to them from a color or from a, a messaging standpoint as far as the different touch points and understanding the, the language and the lingo to be able to make that connection so can you give some examples when you say color like, of, like did, did y'all study color theory in school Anybody, some of the so the graphic design people should have discussed. Did y'all learn anything? What about what you say? Color theory, yeah. like the, the color wheel and stuff, and the primary colors and secondary colors. Yeah. So, in addition to the primary color and secondary colors, there are also different feelings that different colors evoke. So, for example, the color red. The reason that a lot of restaurants use that is because psychologically it makes you hungry. So if you look at different commercials or things that have to do with food, you see the color red a lot. So understanding those different things about um, green is um, also seen as being, you know, peaceful or 
you know, having to do with nature. So you see a lot of companies use that to be able to invoke those different emotions. So bigly on the branding and marketing side, not just what looks good or something that I like, but understanding the business and the different things behind it. So I got a question for you. Like yes, my color was red, black, and white. Is that like, I mean, that's kind of like a normal color, you know, just to try to get you. I know every color means something, yeah. but my typical colors, like you said, I can get away with it. Pretty much. Uh, I would say to do the research on the color theory and see if that applies to your okay. to your industry that you're going into. And what advice about branding? Like, because you, you brand your company, right? And, and what people, you know, are drawn to. I know we, we looked at something like mission statement versus your mantra for a business, right? And like kind of the difference and how, you know, they use different vehicles you know, to show their brand and how everything should kind of look similar, you know, just yeah. Kind of, just so you're talking about just, consistency of brand or? Consistency and like and development, you know. And then also one, another misconception is your brand is not what you say it is, it's what your customers and other people say it is. So you're able to influence that through, you know, what you may be posting on social media or how you're able to have your messaging and other things to articulate that. But at the end of the day, everybody has their own opinion. They're tweeting about it or they're posting on Instagram or whatever about your brand. And those are the things that are going to really affect how other people are perceiving what you're doing. So as far as, you know, social media is huge, right? And I know there are certain, like they say, certain um, best tools to use and certain, like say even times a day and times of the week that you should actually post messages and stuff like that? Do you yeah. have any yeah. Yeah, information on that? Kind so on social media, social media in general, tweeting for your business is not the same as tweeting for your personal. Yeah. So people don't care about what you're eating or you know, the different things that might be going on in your personal life. What you're doing is being able to tell the story of your business. So are you meeting with the client? And that's, you wanna be able to leverage that to for other people to know, okay, well, they have a business because they're already meeting with clients or they're already doing the things that they're talking about. So how are you able to tell that story through social media? And when, do you know like the best time of day? Cause like, I know there's like mm -hmm. a best time of the week. Yeah, so some of the tools that you can use, um, one is Hootsuite. It gives you the ability to, you know, schedule tweets as well as other posts. Um, tweet Deck allows for you to follow different hashtags and conversations or to understand what other people in your industry or your competitors might be talking about. Uh, another tool is called Latergram. It allows for you to schedule Instagram posts. So instead of, if the best time to post is at 9 a.m., happens to at 8.59, come in and type up an Instagram message every day, you can schedule it out for the week and then just make sure that it's gonna post automatically. So then you're able to take that thought process of having to always go back and do it out of it and have a system or something that's more scalable than just doing it that one time. You said it's called Latergram? Uh, for Instagram, it's, it's called Latergram. 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 There are a couple other ones, but that's the one we use. Any other questions? And what were you saying the most popular times to post, like when people are on the most? I yeah, guess. it depends on the platform. Okay. So one good thing about, um, there's a tool called Sprout Social. They have a free version as well as an up, uh, upsell version that you have to pay for. Is that you can schedule the different things that you want to post, and then it's able to use an algorithm to know when's the best time that that should go out. So that's a good, good yeah, Sprout Social. And a personal question for both of you all about starting this spot. Mm -hmm. How did you all start this place? Were you did you get investment? Did you kind of use your own funds? Like you know, how did you go about being able to start such a nice venture and get the real estate and all of that? Well, one we didn't start here. Okay. Um, what was the, the precedence for us is that we already had businesses. Um, at you know at different stages, so we were actually able to come up with the initial startup capital. Mm, okay. um, some of it actually came out of our small angel investment fund. Um, 
but at each step of the journey, we leveraged our influence. Like I have released a book and we've done a book called Kingonomics, if you wanna look it up. And um, Earl and I met at the first conference. So we talk about how do you meet your co-founders. So one of my advisors and investors in Kingonomics was in Austin and Earl was returning from Austin. He was headed from Austin to Atlanta and he told Earl, so Earl changed his plans and came to Kingonomics. So one that showed me somebody who was flexible mm -hmm. and you know could could kind of pivot on a on a at a, at a minute. So we met there and um, started you know building relationship and Earl joined early on as a co-founder. But at each step and stage, we we were pretty savvy in negotiating. Um, like by all traditional methods, we shouldn't be housed. Well, when, when we were in our first location at 200 P Street, we had uh, probably about one third of the space that we have here, but we didn't put, we didn't pay full rent. You know, we went in and negotiated um, some money, but a joint venture. Mm. When we outgrew that and came over here, we were able to sit down and communicate our vision and our passion. And so we've been able to kind of get into this place and then ramp up to now where we're kind of at, you know, full, full, full steam. Mm -hmm. um, developing that confidence and that wisdom or just the fortitude to ask, people can only tell you no, mm -hmm. but understanding how some best practices work. Um, so we also created a good co-founding team. So it's Earl, myself, Bradley Kirkland, who's a tech angel investor. So that gives us kind of our tech credibility. Mm -hmm. um, even though my background had been in tech startups and Earl has the design theory background and development background as well. Uh, we both have international exposure and experience, having commuted and lived outside of the United States mm -hmm. for small periods of time. Um, but we added the tech and then we added what we call unfair advantage was also the consumer products. Because in Atlanta, if you look at spaces like ours, it's like, okay, well, who wants to just start another co-working space? So we had to come up with our, known as our unfair advantage, mm -hmm. right? So our unfair advantage is industries that other people were ignoring, like consumer products, supply chain, creative economy, because everything in Atlanta is like tech, 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 tech. If you're not tech, and tech only. So we're like, we're tech plus, mm -hmm. we're kind of like, untech but tech mm -hmm. and then also we embrace diversity and inclusion at all levels across mm -hmm. all spheres etc and we're intentional about doing that mm -hmm. like if you look at our co-founding team you've got two black guys two white guys right mm -hmm. that's the uniqueness that just nationwide we get on the phone and we're like you own a co-working space you're the first you know black person i've ever you know on the co then you look at our, our advisory board we have women we have females you know we have latino asian white etc so we are intentional about creating that diversity at the leadership level, and then it kind of trickles down. Um, that's a part of our unfair advantage because we get people who want to be in a diverse and inclusive environment. And so, again, that's part of our kind of our value proposition. Okay. Cash flow, real quickly, is right. we bootstrap, right? So we have not raised a lot of outside capital outside what we put in. We did use crowdfunding. Georgia has a crowdfunding law that allows you to raise up to a million dollars annually uh, from the crowd of people. So we raised about $50,000 doing that. Okay, awesome. So just, I think we didn't even get to talk about what a co-working space was. So I don't even think my class knows what that is. I just thought about that. Okay. So can you explain, either of you all explain? Yeah. I'll, I'll take it. It's, it's one. It's a physical space where um, you know being an entrepreneur is very lonely, right? People think you're crazy. Um, people closest to you, like, why can't you just get a job? You know. And then even when you're highly successful and you bring home nice things to mom and dad or your grandparents, they're like, you know, what do you do again? So <laughs> it's a lonely journey. But there's no reason that you can experience. You don't have to experience it in isolation. So a co-working space offers you affordable workspace. Like this is a hot desk. You can come in and grab a hot desk and go work in any of the non-dedicated offices. 
and it's unlimited. So for a couple hundred bucks a month, you get free high speed internet access. Like we got a hundred meg coming in here now, uh, which is pretty pretty big deal. We want a gig, we'll get there. Um, your address offers you legitimacy. You can't get business credit with a PO box or a home address. So with a business, you want to start building your business credit now. Don and Bradstreet number, they call it, a D, D, D and B number. Um, and then people Google you. So when they Google your address and your backyard with your clothes on the back <laughs> comes up, it, it, you lose credibility. And then you need to be around entrepreneurs. So we have and experts, people who've done it. So we have over 50 mentors that kind of like hang out, investors that hang out in the space. Like this afternoon, we got, I think KP Ready is coming over. KP leads a $150 million venture fund in partnership with Burt Ellis. You know, Burt Ellis built IXL. So if you're in the creative space, you should know IXL was one of the, they used to be what SCAD is now. So Herman J. Russell built that building. IXL was in that building. It was like one of the first like global design firms. Like they, that's when people were paying a million dollars for websites, right? Major corporations would pay firms like IXL a million bucks and up for websites and services. But you know, he's a venture capitalist coming to talk um, and we gotta figure out if he's truly confirmed, but he comes through here all the time. And so that's where you meet the investors being in the space. So you can have affordable office space, you can get access to mentorship, education, but that's, pretty much what co-working is. And then it's the culture, right? It's about being around like-minded people, asking them questions. There's someone in here that has an answer to something that you need. Earl, you want to add to that? Um, I think also talking a lot about the curriculum part. So we probably this year planning between you know 150 and 200 events. So everything from having office hours where mentors like KP come out and teach a class to having meetups and things like what we're doing with AI to really expose people to entrepreneurship and how they can start and grow their business.